Kenny, I understand you fly the Sky Crane for Ericsson. That's correct. How long have you been operating this helicopter? I've been with Ericsson for 30 years. And the missions that you perform flying the helicopter, are they exclusively firefighting? They are now. Um, I used to do uh, logging, timber harvesting, and uh, a little bit of construction, but my primary focus here is firefighting now. And Kenny, I understand that you were part of the development team for the firefighting system on the Sky Crane. When did that work originate? And tell me a little bit how that development process came about. Well, my background originally uh, when I got into aviation was in a fixed wing air tanker industry. And I came to work for Ericsson in 1979, and I looked at it that, you know, this would be a great tool for firefighting. And then a gentleman came on board as our CEO and manager for uh, a number of years. and. Uh, he instantly looked at it and said, we need to build a tank. And uh, we did that. We brought in a team of people that were uh, engineers and, and uh, very good at building systems like that. And that, that all occurred, the concept occurred about 1990. The tank was built and designed over the, the 1991 summer. And then the first use of it was on the, uh, the Benfire complex out of Happy Camp on the Klamath River drainage in Northern California in 1991. And we had one or two tanks. We ran for a couple of years doing that. And then uh, um, once we started to branch into international operations, we, we started building tanks. We actually have built several tanks for operators outside the company. And we built the tanks for the DC-10 that you see flying around. So uh, that's kind of where it all came about. As far as the Sky Crane, once the tank is mounted to the helicopter, does it become an essentially permanent fixture at that point, or is it detachable? Oh, absolutely not. We can remove the whole system completely off the aircraft uh, in a neighborhood of a half an hour. So are, are the helicopters that are used primarily for firefighting use, say in Australia and elsewhere, are they multi-mission helicopters? Well, they're all multi-mission helicopters, but uh, um, for example, down in Australia, um, we have a contract requirement in there to be able to uh, have the ability to haul cargo and so we have the pendant that goes up inside and we have long lines and everything which are, are boxed because uh, pretty much all we do is firefighting but we have that ability and of course with the air system that we've developed over the last couple of years um, you're going to see that fine-tuned into modular units we're looking at uh, hazmat we're looking at uh, medevac things like that for uh, the fire departments and that will require quick transition which can be done with preparation and training where you can have the tank off in a very per quick period of time, put a pod that's specific to some function on, or drop the tank entirely. Uh, one of the things that we have is a grapple for removing cars and debris off of a freeway if need be. Any anything for disaster relief. You've heard of this thing called WAS, right? The wide area augmentation system lets you fly GPS glide path approaches without relying on ground-based landing aids. No VOR, no ILS, no problem. Fact is, WAS is so smart, it even knows what you're going to say next time you need it. And don't have it on board. Wah, wah, I want my WAS now! I was really crying there for a second. That leads me into a unique characteristic of the Sky Crane in that it has a rear mounted cockpit behind the forward cockpit where you can act, an operator can actually operate the helicopter, I'm correct, from that position when you're over a station. Does that come into play when you're fighting fires as well? Uh, where we use that is for what we call precision work, uh, precision construction, air handling units, power lines, things like that. We've actually even assembled heavy equipment that way. Um, for an emergency service type situation, um, that's all what we call general delivery out of the left seat. And uh, anything that we would do requiring use of the back seat in, a, in an emergency would actually be the precision reconstruction. But the general day-to-day -day dealings with it, debris removal, uh, firefighting, everything is all done from up front. But the aircraft is definitely multi-mission and has those capabilities. And you recently were uh, active in fighting the fires in Australia. Uh, if you would tell me a little bit about a mission like that. When you get the call, what, what is the process from the time? Well, first off, who calls you when a fire like that happens? Well, all of our fire contracts were under contract to a government agency. And uh, they have a dispatch coordination center. And so that data is forwarded to us once they make the request. Um, they usually give us a... Uh, a Latin long for the fire, almost uh, every country does that, and then various con 
contact information, whether or not there are other aircraft or any special requests they might have, and then we go out and fire up and go. There's usually uh, about a 15-minute response time requirement, so we do quite a bit of uh, extensive pre-flight in the morning systems checks, and then we're uh, usually ready to go. So uh, we can usually get airborne, in, uh, if, if you're ready, in almost 8 to 10 minutes. Now, given the intensity of the fires in Australia recently, where was your base of operations, and how far inland did you have to go from the base as far as the, the turnaround time, essentially? Um, interestingly, because the, the aircraft that I'm based on this year is actually in South Australia near Adelaide, so they ordered us over as a, uh, an additional aircraft. And our base of operations in the uh, Vic state of Victoria is uh, Essendon Airport, which is a satellite airport just north of town. Um, usually came back there every night, but they would move the aircraft around as needed. Sometimes we would be down at La Trobe Valley, sometimes we'd be up at uh, Delatite, but most of the time we'd be back at Melbourne at night. And then we would work out of uh, what they call a sports oval, a cricket pitch, near the areas that they needed to work at the time. The fire front, like, like Mark said earlier, is uh, it was six kilometers out ahead. You couldn't even get near it. So you, that relegates you to uh, the flanks. And uh, again, it, it's a function of uh, life-saving at that point. Helicopter started to bomb and uh, they sort of tidied up along the edge of the fire trail. Very professional. Firefighting certainly changed uh, over the years. Um, there has been no loss of property due to that hard work of the Rural Fire Service, National Parks and New South Wales Fire Brigades and obviously being supported by those larger aircraft. aircraft. Cirrus Design's Vision SJ50 single engine personal jet offers exceptional fuel efficiency, flexible seating for up to seven, advanced avionics, and all the Cirrus safety features you expect, including the Cirrus airframe parachute system. With its detailed design, the Cirrus Vision is technologically advanced, yet engineered to be simple to fly, to allow owner pilots more lifestyle pursuits than any other personal aircraft. Learn more about the Vision SJ50 at CirrusDesign.com. Since these fires were inland, I assume you're taking water from a lake or a pond inland. Uh, interestingly, even in a drought, um, there's enough stored water in and around the Melbourne area to, to satisfy the crane, um, usually little stock ponds and stuff for, for horses. And uh, so finding, finding water in that area isn't too hard. When you get up into the Yarra Forest and up into the interior, it gets a bit tougher. Tell me about the process as far as bringing water on board and then dispersing it over the fire. How do you get the water on board the helicopter and how much water are we talking about? Well, we're, we're talking about 9,000 liters and we go, uh, we get launched to the fire. We make the determination when we get there, we find a water source. Now, if it's salt water, we're going to be using the sea snorkel, which you see on the right-hand side of the tank. And that, that lowers and retracts for each pickup and that allows us to scoop the water in forward flight and stay out of the salt spray. If we have fresh water, then we go to the pond snorkel, which is stowed on the left-hand side, and it remains down until we come back and land. Fresh water fill-up is about 40 seconds with the pond snorkel and about 25 seconds with the sea snorkel. Well, Kenny, I must say, you're doing yeoman's work and a wonderful job and literally saving lives with the sky crane. Well, what I like to think we're doing is helping the people that save lives. The men and women on the ground over there, the uh, men and women on the ground here, the people with the trucks, the people that are doing the hard work, we're there to help them. And uh, I've got the greatest job in the world, and I just hope it makes their job better. Well, sir, I thank you for your efforts, and I'm sure there are many, many others who would share that sentiment.